that, that very quick crumbling of the Iron Curtain uh, was a surprise to almost everybody, but it happens. And it happens when people uh, see a, a, an opportunity to make their wishes known, rise up with a lot of other people. When I was little, I was among those who would hide under their desks against an atomic bomb, you know, as if that would help us at all, you know. Now, take climate change. The disaster is not going to require somebody stupid or somebody drunk or somebody really evil to do something. All it requires is for all of us not to do anything. And some of you young people still be around. You're going to have to deal with that. And uh, the time to do that, of course, was last year. But there's still time to do something about it. So all I'm, all I'm saying is that there are some you know, transcendent issues here that dwarf others in importance. You know, as I've been saying for many years now, the rationale for the attack on Iraq was O-I-L. OK? That's an acronym, folks. <laughs> so if those were the, you know, those were the reasons, in pretty much equal proportion, in my view, we wouldn't have done it without the oil. We wouldn't have done it with the Israeli wanting us to destroy Iraq for them, OK? And we wouldn't have done it if we didn't want permanent, mil well, sorry, we don't say permanent military bases anymore. What do we say? If we didn't want enduring military bases, then we never would have gone in it. Now, with respect to Iran, when the intelligence services faced into that problem in an honest way in 2007, with an honest manager of intelligence, they had to get him from the State Department, given the debacle on Iraq. Uh, they worked all year, and they came up with a decision that read this way. Iran stopped working on a nuclear weapon at the end of 2003 and has not resumed work on a nuclear weapon. We say that 16 U.S. intelligence agencies, quote, with high confidence, end quote. Every year since then, 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, as recently as two months ago, the Director of National Intelligence has revalidated, has reiterated that judgment. Most of us, 70% of Americans, the latest poll, believe that Iran is the greatest threat to us. It's all a crock, as we would say up there in the Bronx, a crock. So th that's important because uh, Obama, uh, while he had enough gumption to head off an Israeli attack on Iran before the election. I don't know what he'll do now, because there are signs that he's weakening on that. Finally, when it looked like Netanyahu was going to start something, uh, Obama gave uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Martin Dempsey, permission at the very end of August to say, I don't want to be implicit if the Israelis attack Iran. When I saw that, I said, whoa, finally. Somebody in an authoritative position is warning the Israelis in a public way, look, you attack Iran before the election, uh, don't expect us to help. They're still pressing, still pressing for attacking Iran. Now, would it be OIL again? Oil, Israel, and logistics, military bases? Well, as I say, with Iraq, I see it as, you know, 33%. With Iran, it would be like 100% I. And it's not politically correct to say that, but Iran poses no danger to us at all. It's not even working on a nuclear weapon. Does it present a, a danger to Israel? Well, yeah, this would be a real stretch. You know, Israel has how many nuclear weapons? 200, okay. Can they deliver them by missile, by air, by under the water, on the surface? Yeah, they can, you know. I'm gonna give a speech uh, up here in the uh, north of here on Monday, and the title is uh, Obama Marching in Lockstep uh, on Iran for Israel. Why? That needs to be called out. I mean, uh, well, when he said he was marching in lockstep behind Israel, do you remember when that was? It was when 100 million people in the United States were watching TV uh, right before the Super Bowl. Not this year, but last year, okay? Now, what an image that is, marching in lockstep. Does anybody know where that comes from? Uh, last half of the 19th century, Reconstruction, lots of blacks in prisons. Uh, the, way they, the way they had a march 
was by putting their right hand over the shoulder of the chained person before them and pull the ball along. And if they didn't march in lockstep, they would fall or they'd really hurt their ankles because those balls on those chains were, were really, really heavy, okay? That's lockstep. And then in the next speech, Obama says, we've got your back, Israel. So put the two together, okay? You're marching in lockstep and we've got Israel's back. Who's, who's, who's doing, who's moving out in front, you know? Who's leading? Who's leading? And, you know, it wouldn't be so bad if George Washington himself didn't warn about entangling alliances or a passionate attachment of one country to another when their real interests diverge. But this is the real danger, in my view, to our national security. If we get involved in a, in a war with Iran, that would make Iraq look like a, like a volleyball game between Mount St. Ursula and St. Helena's Academy, you know? That's what it would make, make it look like. So. Hopefully you can avoid that. Talk about Vietnam, for example, you know. I remember LBJ was told by these uh, blue-suited generals that, uh, you know, they had this great new weapon, a B-52, right? And great big bombs, and they were gonna seal off the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and the Ho Chi Minh is gonna give up. What do you guys think of that, CIA? Well, we could hardly, you know, we suppressed the laugh and we waited a decent interval of two days and we came back now. Mr. President, please realize that the Ho Chi Minh Trail doesn't look anything like uh, I-81 or I-95 or I-66, you know. It's like 162 trails in, in the jungle and some of us know that, know that better than others. And besides that, we know Ho Chi Minh. Uh, some of our guys, uh, OSS people, brought them into Hanoi on their shoulders as the Japanese were driven out. We know what makes him tick. He's the last guy in the world that's gonna quit on the bombing. And so we, now, that's the corollary here. Johnson heard us out. No president would go ahead and embark on a, a major effort like Vietnam without at least consulting with us. But if he didn't like our advice, and if he had political priorities, which he did, because he didn't want to be the first U.S. president to lose a war, right? And so he became the first U.S. president to lose a war. And, you know, the bad thing is that there's never been any Truth and Reconciliation Commission on, on Vietnam. There are all kinds of theories as to what happened, who, who stabbed whom in the back, and, and the real story about what happened in Vietnam is not really readily available.